The Battle of Tel El Kabir in 1882 was perhaps one of the most celebrated victories of the Victorian era. It was the climax of the Anglo-Egyptian War, fought over the stability of Egypt and the security of the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal, finished in 1869, became vital for communications and trade to and from Britain and her empire in the east. It was no surprise then when, in the late 1870s, civil and military unrest came to the forefront in Egypt that something had to be done to stabilize the situation. Arabi Pasha, an energetic leader and the Egyptian Minister of War, became the leader of a rebellion against the Khedive, or Viceroy, of Egypt. By June of 1882, the British found themselves allied with the Khedive, fighting against his own Minister of War. The first phase of the conflict was the bombardment of the forts at Alexandria by the Royal Navy. Destruction was comprehensive, with the mighty ironclads like Superb, Alexandra, and Inflexible dominating the shore-based fortifications. It was thought that perhaps this action would bring about the end of hostilities, but this proved to be overly hopeful. By mid-August, an army of some 40,000 men had been dispatched from around the Empire. Infantry, cavalry, artillery, engineers, and other troops ultimately came from Britain, Gibraltar, Aden, Malta, Cyprus, and of course India. Chosen to command this army was Lieutenant General Sir Garnet Wolseley. The first of these forces landed initially at Alexandria. They cautiously pushed inland, beginning what was to become one of the most celebrated campaigns of the mid to late Victorian era. The British army that fought in the Anglo-Egyptian War was archetypal, to say the least. Although some experimental uniforms of drab grey had been ordered for this expedition, these had not yet been issued. Thus, the army campaigned and fought in its traditional colours. There were scarlet serge frocks for the infantry and heavy cavalry, with blue versions for the artillery, light cavalry, and the services. There was, however, some use of drab or khaki. Troops dispatched from the Indian theatre wore this colour, as it had been used there for quite some time. The 1st Battalion Seaforth Highlanders, part of the Indian contingent, were conspicuous in their red trues and khaki frocks. The battalion of the King's Royal Rifle Corps were of course dressed in their traditional green. Another interesting historical point is that the army had only recently undergone a comprehensive reorganization, chiefly amongst the infantry. The old numbered regiments, such as the 24th Foot of Islandwana and Works Drift fame, and the 42nd Highlanders, now bore names such as the South Wales Borderers or the Black Watch. This had been the product of the Childers reforms, and was so recent that most of the regimental distinctions had not yet been rectified. For instance, the 2nd Battalion of the Highland Light Infantry, formerly the 74th Highlanders, were still wearing their trues of Lamont Tartan. The same expedient was observed in the 1st Battalion of the Seaforth Highlanders, formerly the 72nd Highlanders, who still wore their trues of Prince Charles Edward Stuart Tartan, and not the Mackenzie kilt of the new regiment. British troops were armed with the Martini Henry, while Indian troops were armed with the Snyder. The Egyptian army was in their summer white uniforms, topped with a red tarbush or fez, and carrying 11mm Remington rolling blocks. With the initial landings and operations around Alexandria providing somewhat of a distraction, the main body of the army sailed up the Suez Canal, landed, and took Ismailia. It was from this position that the decisive moments and actions of the war were to develop from. Following the line of the Sweetwater Canal and the railway, the army fought its way west with a notable action at Cassassine. Soon the advance was checked by major fortifications to the west around Tel El Kabir. Here the army paused to allow for preparations for battle. The Egyptian position was a strong one. Extending north from the canal was a line of entrenchments, earthworks, and redoubts 
for infantry and artillery. In front of these earthworks was a ditch some five foot deep, giving an overall height of some ten feet. Interspersed along this line were numerous redoubts, holding anywhere from three to five guns each. These photographs taken just after the battle indicate well the open nature of the ground and why these fortifications were so formidable. Some 20,000 men garrisoned this position. Due to the strength of the Egyptian position and his desire to have a decisive victory, Wolseley opted for a night attack. In the evening of the 12th of September, the camp at the lock at Cassassine was broken and the troops moved to their assembly areas where they bivouacked until the order to step off was given. Mackenzie. Yes, Sergeant. Come on now, get fell in. End off with your great coat. You'll know we need that this morning. Right away, Sergeant. <sighs> yes, this is us then. The camp at Cassassine would be the last comfort they'd have for quite some time. The army at Tel El Kabir was formed of two divisions, each of two brigades. In addition to this were the Royal Artillery and the Indian contingent. Wolseley formed for the attack thus. On the right front was the 2nd Brigade, commanded by Graham. In support, the Guards Brigade under the Duke of Connaught. With the massed guns of the Royal Artillery in the centre, the left was formed by the Highland Brigade and two battalions of Ashburnham's Brigade. On the extreme left, to the south of the canal, was the Indian contingent, including the 1st Battalion, the Seaforth Highlanders. This, combined with a small reserve and the cavalry on the right flank, was what made the attack the morning of the 13th of September. At 1.30 in the morning, the advance began. The approach was made across stony sand that was open and flat, devoid of all cover. Orders were given that bayonets were not to be fixed and rifles were not to be loaded. The approach was remarkable, as only the noise of the men's feet, wheels of their artillery, and the horses could be heard in the still clear night. There was, however, one exception. Shut up! Shut up, Chuck! Shut up! A man of the Highland Light Infantry, presumably drunk, began making all kinds of noise and racket. Those around him saw to him very quickly indeed. The nighttime advance had caused the attack to echelon slightly to the right, and it was the Highland Brigade on the left which first arrived close to the enemy position. They had made it to within 200 yards of the Egyptians. Suddenly, musketry erupted from the Egyptian position. While still on the march, the men fixed bayonets, and then the bugles sounded the charge. With an almighty cheer, the Highland Brigade surged forward. As the men reached the edge of the ditch, some opened fire as their comrades clambered down, only to begin the scramble up and over. The action was frantic. Trying to climb a ten-foot embankment under fire was exceptionally dangerous. Gradually, man by man and section by section, the top of the earthworks was gained and the fight through the objective would be done. Fighting was terribly close with the Egyptians only on the other side of the burn.
for a while, the fighting ebbed back and forth across the earthwork. Eventually, the upper hand was gained, and the Egyptians began withdrawing back from the fortification. The battle, however, was far from won. On the Egyptian right flank, in front of the Highland Brigade, there existed a second line of entrenchments. Once the Highlanders had forced the Egyptians from this first line, they withdrew, making a stand at the second. The Highland Brigade then found itself under fire from many directions, and they broke down into smaller groups, each fighting their way across the space between the first and second lines. Private Tut of the Royal Marine Light Infantry wrote of the battle. It was a time of wild confusion and fury, the ceaseless, savage plying of butt and bayonet, and the driving forth of a dispirited and panic-stricken horde. There was a hideous clamor, the shouts of the combatants, the rattle of musketry, the clash of steel, the crash of artillery, the cries of the wounded, and the despairing screams of the dying masses. And above all, there rose that sound which you can never mistake, the skirl of the pipes, for as soon as the Highlanders were in the trenches and on their tops, their bagpipes rose in wild strains, and the fire to kill the troops to great achievements. On the right flank, surprise had not been as pronounced, and the brigade on that flank was forced to fight its way to the position. Eventually, a lodgment was gained, and they too swept forward, pushing the enemy from their fortifications. The fighting was close, and momentum was key, but inexorably, Wolseley's army was able to sense victory, and they rushed forward, driving the Egyptians before them. There comes a moment in battles such as this, when the will of the enemy breaks, and after very stiff fighting, the Egyptian army began to melt away, retreating across the desert in the direction of Cairo. It was now time for the artillery and the cavalry to come forward. It wasn't all done yet. The position still needed to be cleared of any remaining Egyptian soldiers. There weren't many and all that was left were the remnants of the Egyptian army retreating back across the desert. Private Tuffalo, Tel El Kabir, like Inkerman, a soldier's battle, and an infantryman's at that. When we had done our work with the bayonet, the rest was left to the cavalry and artillery. It was marvelous to see the way in which the British gunners rushed their weapons over obstacles and swept the flying masses down. And it was terrible to watch the British and Indian cavalry pursuing and destroying the fugitives. There was no escape for them, and recognizing this, they surrendered and were made prisoners. And it was pleasanter work to take their bodies rather than their lives.
The battle proved to be everything it had been intended to be. It had routed the Egyptian army, and the way was left open to Cairo. The cavalry and the Indian contingent moved forward and occupied Zagazig, and later, on the evening of September the 14th, Cairo. Of course, there was still the matter of collecting the casualties and dead from the battlefield, and the collection of prisoners. Wolseley and his army had been triumphant. The rebellion in Egypt hadn't just been defeated, it had been completely crushed. Two medals were issued for participants in this campaign. As had become commonplace, a campaign medal was issued, the Egypt Medal, and it bore the bar Tel El Kabir. Unusually, however, because of the importance of the campaign in restoring the Khedive, he too issued a medal to all participants, the Khedive Star. The greater campaign in northeast Africa was far from over, however. Over the next three or four years, fighting and campaigning moved to the south, eventually focusing on a town in the middle of the Sudan, Khartoum. I'd like to take a short moment and discuss some of the kit worn in this video. As was mentioned earlier, the campaign was fought using uniforms in the traditional colors. For equipment, the men used the Pattern 71 valise equipment. Most of the artwork of the period shows this equipment worn in a stripped down, lighter order. Figuring prominently is the inclusion of the mess tin in its black oilskin cover strapped to the middle of the braces in the center of the back. Another interesting feature is the wearing of the expense pouch strapped to the back of the belt. This is contrary to the normal position where it was strapped to the brace ring underneath the right hand ammunition pouch. Here we can see the version I used to represent this order of dress during the shoot. Using a technique described in some artwork, I used the suspending strap of the expense pouch to loop over the cross of the braces. This took the weight of the expense pouch and the 30 rounds of ammunition I carried in it off the back of the belt. Another important historical aspect is the fact that the unit represented in the video did not participate in the battle. The uniform that was worn represents that of the 2nd Battalion Seaforth Highlanders, formerly the 78th Highlanders. Although there was a battalion of Seaforth Highlanders present at the battle, this was the 1st Battalion formerly the 72nd Highlanders. They had recently been successful under Roberts fighting in Afghanistan and, as they had been posted to the Far East, had not yet received the uniform of the new regiment. Although the uniform of the Seaforth Highlanders closely resembled that of the 78th Highlanders, I thought that they may have had the opportunity, at a minimum, of changing the facings on their frock. The 78th, of course, wore buff facings, but after they amalgamated with the 72nd, this changed to yellow. So, as you can see, it bears a strict resemblance to the style of uniform worn in the Highland Brigade by the Camerons, the Black Watch, the Gordons, and the Highland Light Infantry. Had the 2nd Battalion Seaforth Highlanders been present at the battle, this is the kit they probably would have worn. As an historical interest point, I've included the following photographs. This is the bugle upon which drummer Alcorn of the Camerons played the charge when they advanced upon the Egyptians at Tel El Kabir. These were the pipes played by Pipe Major Grant, also of the Camerons, as he piped his battalion into the attack. The tune recorded as being played that day was March of the Cameron Men. Before closing, I have to make mention of the help that I got with this video. Your camera work and help were indispensable. Thank you very much, Jared.